Well, it's four o'clock. So should we go ahead and get started? We can always talk, keep talking. You know, we've got plenty of things to cover. So um, hello, everyone. I am um, Dr. Kawai Yu, um, Assistant Professor of Music at Dixie State University. And um, I'm also the director of BSU Early Mix Music Ensemble class. So um, today we have this wonderful panel discussion. Why early music? Repertoire, interpretation, and practicality is part of the DSU Early Music Festival 2021. So I'm so glad today and my honor to have um, some panelists um, to uh, lead this discussion a little bit about uh, in this interesting topic. So I'm going to introduce them first. Um, and so Dr. Sonia Lee. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. She is our guest um, artist who perform on Saturday on a wonderful harpsichord recital. We're so glad to have her. She is editor of the Early Music Journal, uh, past president of the uh, Historical Keyboard Society of North America, fantastic soloist and collaborated artist on various historical keyboards and also modern piano throughout North and Latin America, Europe, and Asia. And then we have Dr. Anne Levisky. She is our DSU visiting scholar from, from the humanities departments, had a PhD in, uh, from Columbia University in musicology, uh, specialized um, in uh, troubadour songs and medieval vocal music. Uh, she's a soprano and also a hurdy-gurdy performer. <laughs> and then we have Professor Susan Talley, and Susan Talley is our um, organ faculty at Dixie State University, also organist of Grace Aspicable Church. Um, you're also in Tuacan High School. Also. Tuacan has gone away, but I'm doing accompanying at um, Dixie Middle and High Schools right now. Fantastic. Yeah, so as a, as a pianist and organist. Uh, and uh, Professor Talley has degrees from Princeton University and Royal Danish uh, Conservatory of Music uh, training from there. Um, and before moving to St. George, Utah, she uh, was organist at several uh, big churches in Florida, Idaho, and North Carolina. So to start us off, you know, I think um, the three things that we're going to talk particularly is the repertoire, interpretation, and practicality of early music. And I think, you know, it's always even like how to define early music, you know, what is early music? You know, I sometimes some people like joke to me like, oh yeah, early music are, you know, old music, like for old people, you know, so they, they, they wake up really early and, uh, <laughs> and so early, early. Um, it's true, actually I, I woke up pretty early, but, um, um, but I think, you know, we, we can have better definition of that kind of music, what kind of music by looking into the repertoire maybe um, because it's so easy, you know, people are very familiar with like Baroque music and that's early music. And um, they know about, J you know, people know about J.S. Bach, they know about Vivaldi, Handel, and maybe if you're a pianist, you know a little bit about Scalati. But what about, um, you know, any pieces before that, beyond that, like, you know, after that. Um, so, um, so I like to start off by talking about, you know, to define, well, you know, what do you mean, you know, uh, the context of early music and what repertoire. Uh, maybe the panelists can answer, like, you know, can you share like some early, you know, great early repertoire or composers that may maybe easily uh, more approachable that, you know, both professionals or students can, can um, you know, approach that. Well, um, I think I will start first. I must uh, say a few words about the term early music. Now, no joke. I, um, I have really encountered people uh, who, who, who have told me that uh, they, they thought the early music means morning concerts <laughs> or, or, um, or childhood musical education. <laughs> and personally, I I. I I, I find this term very confusing and too broad. Um, the, the term refers to, um, if you're talking about Baroque musicians, period instrumentalists, very often we refer to um, the, the, the Baroque literature. But this term is also used for Renaissance music. We're talking about music from the 
from the 1400 to the 1600. The term is also used for medieval music, um, roughly from maybe 600 to 1400. So we're talking about too much music here. This term is, th this term just embraces too, too, too much literature. And personally, when I communicate with, uh, with, with both professionals and the public and, and students, I would usually stick to the, the, the names of the style period, the name of the era or period like Baroque, Renaissance or medieval, or I would usually, um, I, I personally like to use uh, the, 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 the century number, for example, 17th century music, 15th century music, etc. cetera. So um, um, I, I don't think I answered uh, Kawai's question just now, but I, I, I feel like I must, I must express uh, the, uh, the, 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 the general confusion of, of this term. Uh, among uh, both professionals and the public. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the, you know, a little bit of uh, explanation. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, to do that. And, and that's perfect. Uh, I, a little bit of uh, logistical thing. I'd like to make sure that everybody who is involved um, today, uh, you are welcome to leave any uh, questions or comments in the chat, uh, type it during the chat. And then I think, you know, since we have about three parts um, sections in this discussion in between, we could always you know, the panelists or, you know, or me or who would like to answer or address those, we can do that. Um, and at the very end, I'd like to leave maybe five or, or more minutes, uh, like a general Q&A at the end. So, you know, everybody are welcome to, to be part of this discussion. So, um, great, great. I think that's, that's the thing. So, while talking about that, um, so, so now that we have a better, so, so what, what was your take on that, uh, uh, Susan? Um, well, I, I, I was nodding my head a lot with Dr. Lee because even though I cannot claim to have played a lot of Renaissance organ music or even music from medieval times, most of my training was in the immediate Baroque or pre-Baroque, if you want, periods, because that's the music that is so incredibly profound for organists in terms of counterpoint and learning really wonderful techniques. So I don't have anything to say about well medieval music or Renaissance music for the organ, but I think there is so much mass confusion around the term early music and what that means in terms of how many centuries are we talking about and can we come up with better labels, more precise labels so that students and professionals alike are talking about the same thing. I definitely share that confusion. Yeah. I don't, don't claim to have any expertise about medieval or Renaissance organ music because I really haven't played any. It, it doesn't speak to me entirely the way Baroque music definitely speaks to me. Yeah. Um, I could jump in and say a couple of words about things uh, before the Baroque period because I work on music from the 12th and 13th centuries and have experience performing stuff from um, plain chant through to Baroque arias. Um, and I think that this idea of early music is something that musicology as a, an academic field perpetuates. So <laughs> when you're looking at the breakdown of professors in a department, say, or the types of jobs that get listed for new um, PhDs, you'll often see jobs saying, well, we want someone who does 18th century or 18th and 19th century music popular 20th century and then early music is sort of 1750 and above and so people in the field tend to lump us all together into one great conglomerate as well which um is frustrating <laughs> when you work on that period you're like well yeah but I do stuff that's so different from someone who works on Handel or Bach or Scarlatti they're they're two diff completely different worlds separated by 500 plus years so you're often expected to be someone who can teach everything from 500 to 1500, sometimes to 1800, depending on the department. Um, and you really are expected to have the ability to speak to so many different types of musical genres that the, it's, it's no wonder that like the term leeches out into the general public and confuses everyone because also medievalists and Renaissance scholars can't agree on when the 
middle ages and the renaissance begin and end it's different in every field you look at um so that's yeah that's all i have to say about that just that this is something that's that's very broad and sort of systemic in the discipline yeah and i think i think i think that's, that's so wonderful that three of you gave some little you know starting point on, on that because we call it classical music for example you know it's but then we know there's a classical period you know like you know like you know 18th century especially uh you know but but so and and, and dr lewis is, is, is definitely correct about like yeah you know, how can you define you know this is baroque music so i guess there is there is a broad broad understanding of it that's also like an, you know some people will look at it oh maybe you know that's referred to music specifically you know before you know at the end by Bach. but on, on the other hand you know early music approach that has to go to the next topic about interpretation later because well true but can be early music too i mean you know uh, it depends how you look and from where and when you look at it. Um, today, we're not necessarily trying to get the answer, but I'm, you know, I just want to bring that out um, to confuse you more, right? Uh, <laughs> actually, no. so, so, so we really think about, I, I think that's the main thing. We want to think about it. We want to uh, get, get to know it. Sorry, Professor Pelly. No, I, I was just laughing because I totally agree with you. We, we need to get it out there and maybe trying to put labels on various Errors of composition is only of limited importance. Um, no. So the errors of composition bleed one from the other, and they go back and forth, kind of like hemlines used to do when, when women wore skirts. And uh, it's maybe that's not a bad thing, and maybe we don't need to confine you know little errors of music into this century and that century. I mean, I think it gets at how we teach music history as well. Like we're very interested in categorizing and fitting things into a very specific chronological timeline. And um, maybe we should rethink that. Maybe mm -hmm. our students don't need to define centuries as neat pockets of 100 years when, as you say, stuff is bleeding across century lines. I mean, it seems like every time I am doing research to teach a new section of my music history class, I'm encountering the long 13th century, the long 14th century. And that's like, well, where's the, the 15th century just gets eaten up by the long 14th. And long 14th. <laughs> so maybe we just need to be thinking about how we're teaching music history and, and redefining it mm -hmm. along different sorts of strands of influence maybe, or thinking um, outside of the traditional way that people yeah. have taught history and music. Right, and I think, I think your point about the strands of influence is very important too, because what we call French Baroque is so different from German Baroque and the approach to ornamentation is different. The style of instruments in the case of the pipe organ is so different so that strands of influence become as important as what year it was written in. Right, that's, that's basically, that's, yeah. And, and that's, that's definitely, we'll, we'll, we'll lean into that more in the second part of um, what, okay. So we have quite a bit of, uh, you know, uh, college students in, 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 in this discussion. So how the, you know, the, the three panelists, uh, do you have any suggestion for like, you know, okay, we want to look beyond Bach or Handel or, you know, or Vivaldi or even Talimann. Uh, what, what, how, how do they, they guess that? Like, you know, there are some composers that maybe you can name a, a couple or something that, you know. Well, I think a, a school of composition, at least for organists, maybe not so much for vocalists, maybe not so much for harpsichordists, but we organists have a way of neglecting the Italian Baroque other than Vivaldi. And Vivaldi really didn't write that much for the organ. Uh, Bach transcribed some wonderful Vivaldi works for the organ, but there are wonderful composers, Martini, Derante, Marcello, and Valeri, who their, their stuff is just incredibly beautiful and nobody's ever heard of them. And I, I would love to promote more Italian Baroque with my students. And I, I try to play it a lot myself. And usually people really relate to it almost as much as they relate to, for example, Vivaldi Four Seasons. So I would, I would be a real advocate for more Italian Baroque. I don't know how our other panelists feel about that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Dr. Yu cited uh, Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, I would encourage um, pianists, piano students to explore um, several other 18th century Baroque composers. Uh, and many of them are French uh, classicists. Many, many of them are French uh, composers. Uh, 
Um, one, two very important ones are François Couperin and Jean-Philippe Rameau. Um, and and on, on YouTube, um, in, 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 in the public domain, we, we actually hear lots of pianists playing music by these French composers, French baroque composers um, on the piano. So I would strongly encourage pianists to, um, to explore um, music, solo keyboard music, solo piano uh, or harpsichord uh, or organ music by, by these French composers. Um, moving backward a little bit, I would um, suggest piano students to explore keyboard works by Italian composers like um, Girolamo Frescobaldi, whose dates are um, 1583 through 1643, uh, and he had a, um, a career at the Vatican um, he, 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 he was really um, important in, in the development of the toccata form. Okay. So, um, and I would also encourage students to, to explore um, as much ensemble music as possible. For example, um, if you're a keyboardist, you might wanna explore small ensemble pieces with violin, with violin or other strings by, um, by Corelli, um, Alexandro Scalati, Monteverdi, etc. I guess I can jump in and talk a little bit about um, vocal music. Uh, there's so much great stuff for singers in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It really is like a dream. There's so many beautiful pieces that you can pick from um, and they you can really enter at a range of ability levels. So um, for example, there's a lot of monophonic stuff or one melody stuff that you can do on your own. You don't even need anybody to sing or play with you. Um, and it generally the ranges are pretty contained. So they're really good pieces for you to learn on and sort of explore things with your voice. You can look at um, sacred plain chants or secular music in vernacular languages like um, the troubadour songs that were on this weekend's concerts. Those are great. Uh, also, for solo repertoire that's a bit later, I am a huge fan of Barbara Strozzi. Um, I just love her pieces and I did a whole concert of them a couple of years ago. And there's so much stuff that you just never hear. And she's a, a really fine female composer from um, late Renaissance Italy, Venice primarily. And there's a lot of beautiful things that you can do. And then you, do, you get to collaborate with a keyboard player, which is always a treat for a singer. We love that. Um, and then finally, if you're interested in doing some ensemble work, there's a lot of really great stuff for beginning ensembles, or you can sort of build up in difficulty. Um, and Dr. Yu, I know that you've transcribed a Parisian chanson for your, um, your viol concert, for yeah. the Friday night's mm -hmm. concert, which I love. I love that song, um, that piece by uh, Tant que vivre. It's a, by oh, Claudine yeah. de Salmissi. It's lovely. And that is such a great piece for, for learning how to sing as an ensemble. Um, it's very chordal, so you have to tune to each other. You get used to singing these pieces um, before you can then take your ensemble singing skills and apply them elsewhere. And there, there's, I mean, gosh, there's tons of great stuff for ensemble singers in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. It just depends what you want. Um, but yeah, I love singing those um, more homophonic pieces because they're great great ensemble workers and they're beautiful. They're just like such a joy to sing as well. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do. Definitely, that's so much great repertoire. Wow. Yeah, the vo vocal part of that. Yeah, and it's particularly an company ones like monophonic, you know, it's, it's great. You know, you can actually sing, you know, without worry about getting accompaniments in. But, um, and, and Dr. Lee mentioned about strings a little bit about Corelli, definitely. Um, you know, I can represent a little bit about strings. Um, and Germiniani is another composer you want to uh, know about. And uh, uh, I was just thinking about, um, and, and there, there are plenty of really good music, solo music before Bach. And people always just like, oh yeah, I, oh, I start with my Bach cello suite and that's the earliest, or Bach Patita. Uh, Heinrich Bieber, uh, it's, a, it's a great composer uh, on the company with Scott Atura already retuning. Uh, and, and or you know, Domenico Gabrielli for cello in the company. Mm -hmm. 
There, there are a lot Tal of great music. Yeah, Dr. Lee. Talaman. I wanted to mention about Talaman, who who wrote lots and lots of music. He 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 is probably the most prolific composer to date um, in the entire Western music history. He wrote more than three thousand compositions for 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 both small and large scale um, productions or ensembles. So, Georg Philipp Talaman. And and Talaman, is that am I right? Correct me. Um, Bach was. Oh no, that's another person. Okay, sorry, I was thinking about Buxtehude. Okay, you're thinking about Buxtehude. Yes, Buxtehude yeah, was, was an en about, like, enormous Bach. influence on Bach. Uh, well, I Bach actually walked like 250 miles to see a concert. Um, right, and he he way overstayed his leave. He had a leave of absence from his job, and he stayed over at least twice as long as he was supposed to, but he didn't care. He was just so enraptured with Buxtehude's improvisation and counterpoint skills. He really didn't care whether he had a job when he got home or not, and he he got his job, so it was it was okay. <laughs> okay. Any, any questions from... Um, the attendees uh, at this point, quick question. I'm, I'm going to go to jump to the next point otherwise. And you guys can always leave anything on the chat. One, one area of composition we haven't talked about is uh, perhaps both Dr. Lee and Dr. Levitsky would like to talk about the English school. Uh, there's a large uh, opus of English Baroque composers that I also play pretty regularly and people really love. John Stanley, Samuel Wesley, William Boyce, Maurice Green, uh, these men are, you know, they're not neglected, that would be an exaggeration, but they're certainly not played as much as the German school or even the French school. They're, and they're wonderful composers. That's awesome. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, um, when you were talking about interpretation, so you've asked us to talk about a couple of different things. I was thinking a lot about um, Bird and Talis and Tudor England and the, like when I'm preparing a piece, what sorts of things am I looking for? And I'm really interested in um, the larger culture. So how are people living? What sorts of forces are um, impinging on them as they make music and these types of things. And um, I love that particular moment when Henry VIII decides to start the Anglican church and gets rid of the Catholic church. And we have people who've been making a living as church musicians in the Catholic vein and are Catholic then having to make a living as Anglican church musicians, but still practicing Catholics and hiding it from Henry and all of this stuff. And Bird and Talis are two of those um, figures who are related to that time period. And so when I was thinking about your question about like, what do I do when I'm preparing a piece or putting together a concert or looking for something interesting to sing? Um, I'm thinking a lot about sort of things that are happening in history that affect the type of music that's being made. There's a lot of music that these composers who have had to switch from being Catholic to Anglican seemingly overnight are writing um, in Latin, sort of like hiding it from uh, the Anglican church. And I find that stuff really interesting because they kind of go from being at home in their country to strangers in their own country. And you can see some of that in the music. So yeah, yeah that kind of foreshadows, sorry, what you <laughs> wanted to talk about. Lovely, lovely. So oh, as we talk about English music, I saw Dr. Pickington, a uh, question to the team, the uh, chat saying, what about Henry VIII as a composer? What influenced his music? I know uh, nothing. <laughs> well, who's uh, familiar with that? Not super familiar with, I mean, I've done one of his pieces. Um, and as I recall, it was pretty simple and it was all about having a good time. So, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That sounds like music. That checks out, right? Like Henry VIII, he wanted what he wanted and he did what he wanted to do to get it. So that was sort of, um, that's the extent of my expertise <laughs> with Henry VIII. But, but yeah, he did compose and we do have record of some um, monarchs composing, which is really cool because it shows that they were very interested in musical culture and participating in music. And I mean, Louis XIV was involved in ballets and I'm sure that you guys could say more about and him. He He's a good ballet dancer. Yeah, and so I find that fascinating because you see sort of monarchs, instead of just being performed for, they're actively engaged, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think we should probably move on to the second one, but be, uh, and, and for those of you, uh, and I, I want to also, Irish, uh, you know, talk about like, even though we talk about composers other than those people, even if you're looking at Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, and, uh, you know, Zgatti, 
you can also look at their different works because people like know about handle like oh messiah that's the, the only thing they talk about but you know um as you know as you we just saying one of the opera arias you know julius cesare but there there are many other great works that these composers wrote whether it's opera or you know instrumental works um or you know uh, big like orchestral suites or other other music that we can look at uh, and i think we can all explore uh if there's not if there's instrumental directors here you know that we can even talk about more uh orchestral music now interpretation let's go to the second part of this panel discussion uh the question is how can we you know perform what what do you mean when people say historically informed like how you know how am i going to be um what is something that we should look at um in order to interpret it, interpret a piece say like before 1750 what are some other things preparation you do you know i ask the panelists that you you know to be so-called historically informed well i can start if you like i mean when i'm working on pieces um especially the earlier the better like when i'm look, working on pieces that are from the 12th 11th thir 13th centuries, I will go back to the manuscript source, whether that's in what we call a facsimile, which is like a really expensive detailed copy of the manuscript, or a, a lot of libraries have sources online. So you can go and look at troubadour songs in a manuscript from the 14th century on the French um, Bibliothèque Nationale's website, for example. So I always want to see what they look like on the page. I often will make my own transcriptions of pieces. Um, I'm trained to read uh, notation, um, which honestly isn't terribly difficult. There are lots of online camps or summer camps that you can take to, to learn how to read notation or read um, musical manuscripts from a variety of time periods. If you're interested, there, there are lots of opportunities and more and more they're online, which is awesome. Um, so I, I definitely start by making my own edition, so to speak. And then, as I mentioned before, I also want to know about the larger cultural background. So what were these musicians doing? Were they traveling around? Were they involved in other ways in the court system? Um, is there anything written about how they performed? If what, what kinds of instruments are accompanying them if there's nothing written on the page, which there often is not anything written on the page about what kinds of instruments would accompany them. So those are the types of things that I like to do. There, you know, what do we know about these composers? What sorts of other roles did they hold? And for me, that's the historian in me coming out. I really like to know what's going on in the broader cultural background because I think it, it comes to bear in really important ways on the way that we make music. So that's what I would do. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about keyboard music? How, you know, how do you, because we are yeah, pianists here, modern piano, like, well, I, you know, I should all play, we should all play on Steinway, you know, it's loud and it's, 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 it's beautiful and it's expensive, so it must be good, right? So how, how, how should we interpret it? Uh, how do we, you know, if we have a good Baroque keyboard piece, what are some other criteria we need to look at? Well, I think in, in, in the realm of, uh, let's say 18th century piano keyboard music um i i, I think m many learners or performers are facing lo lots of um lots of questions uh but when they look at the music because there's minimal um minimal instructions as to what to do with the with 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 the piece for example they you 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 may not see a whole lot of dynamic markings face marks um so um so as performers we actually have to figure all these things out and i think the core um of uh, 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 the core solution to 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 the problems here is is actually able to understand the, the rhetoric the meaning of of the piece um and and, and from there, you decide uh, what to do with dynamics, as opposed to you are being told by, by the addition, by the score, um, what dynamics to, 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 to apply. Um, so to summarize what I just said, I, I, I brought up this, this, uh, this general 
difficult question that we often face uh, when we read, when we study um, early music, Baroque music, Renaissance music. We, we don't often see a whole lot of um, uh, performance instructions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, that's always the case, huh? And yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And with my experience in Copenhagen, where I was pri privileged to study for two years, all of my lessons took place in great downtown uh, Copenhagen churches, which were not used for religious services very often, but were just incredibly beautiful musical spaces. So I was very lucky that I had free access to practice and every single instrument taught you something different about the music because every single instrument expressed it differently. And of course it depended on the size of the room, depended on the size of the instrument, depended on the action of the tracker instrument itself. So again, going along with what Dr. Lee said, most of the time I'd sit down in front of a, a score by Buxtehude or Scheidt or Bach, and you just have to decide what really makes this come alive in this building with this instrument. And you're not given a heck of a lot of guidance except from my wonderful teacher that gave me a lot of guidance on how to figure that out. Um, and there's always the dilemma of ornamentation and how ornamentation uh, symbols differentiated between composers, differentiated between uh, schools of writing and how to figure that out. Do I start the ornament on the note above? Do I start the ornament on the beat? How do I, how do I figure all that out to make it more expressive and continuation of the musical thought rather than being an interruption of the musical thought? And there is just a lot of room for either creativity or error, whichever way you want to look at it. And I'm sure I did a little bit of both. And, uh, it's it's a big guessing game, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> so. I mean, I'll say to jump into what you both have been saying, Sonia and Susan, just um, the way that you might look at a Baroque aria score, which goes back to the beginning, and then you just repeat the first section again, you wouldn't necessarily know that you're supposed to ornament that. They're not written out. They The singers themselves would improvise them and sort of work them into their voices their own ways. So um, along with along those lines, it also happens in vocal scores as well. And you sort of have to know the convention uh, and know what ornaments might sound like, as you say, so that you can sort of improvise off of a style that you already know. I've already heard, right? I've already heard, right. yeah, which is tricky. Mm -hmm. That's actually very interesting. I, I like Dr. Lisa, but um, but it, it, it's actually, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make this discussion to be like close to, you know, like, people like no ex no former experience in early music so it's like well a country folk singer do do a little bit of that a jazz musician do that oh uh, yes absolutely and that's the thing that's pretty interesting because well like this is early music so this is like serious people sitting there like study their manuscript every day and uh, <laughs> but they actually improvise they actually create recreate things and that's kind of interesting um uh, doctor sorry i'll i'll, I'll keep, keep going Oh, um, if you talk about improvisation, um, I, I wanted to point out that it's never possible to, uh, to, to document every single idea on, 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 on a piece of paper. Um, so um, I, I guess if we talk about the Western music tradition, there they are, they, they are pieces that, 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 that are just notated with, with uh, shorthand notation. For example, figured bass. Figured bass is a system uh, using just figures to, 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 um, to refer to harmonies. Um, jazz musicians use uh, you know, a, a similar system to, to, to refer to different chords and harmonies too. Um, and, and organ and lute players uh, would, uh, organ and lute composers would use tablature notation sometimes to, to, to compose. So when we study these, these pieces, uh, uh, sometimes we have to kind of like translate or be able to read, be able to realize um, the, 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 the notation of the music that, that, that we play. So, so I want to give an example um, to uh, 
those who are, you know, um, I could do share a screen right here. Let's see here. Um, even though this is not really a presentation, it's more discussion, but I thought it's uh, it's helpful. Um, like if I do, uh, where's my, I don't have the share screen button. Oh, here. Okay, here you go. Um, so like, say you have this, I mean, this is just Google. So <laughs> by the way, Dr. D was talking about figure base, right? So that, that's the figure base. That's what the composer had, you know, and then you see this, um, the realization, you know, with that, of course, I don't know if that's a good realization or not, <laughs> realization, but it is how, and, and that depends, you know, depends how you realize it. You can, you can do a lot of different things, you know, different rhythm, you know, uh, to make sure you're in the right context. And, and a lot of people didn't, don't know about that. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to play my Vivaldi violin sonata. And I'm, I, you know, I, I buy my piano parts from this edition, but they didn't realize these are actual realization of the figure base. That's the information that like Dr. Lee said is, it, well, it's just the figure base and you just realize it. Um, and so, so that's a, a lot of things that we learn about that. Um, I, I do like to ask the, the attendees questions here. I like to be, get you involved. Like, so um, yeah, but why, why is it, matter to be historically informed like you know in terms of you know um i why why should i not play bach in in tchaikovsky style you know um th because there was a time people feel like well i am you know i am kawaii so i should play everything in kawaii style you know whether i play bach or what what you know why should i why is it better to play bach in the bach way or play Brahms in the Brahms way. You know, anybody want to talk about it? Um, the panelists could talk about it, but anybody else can also, do you want to say a few things, anybody? My student? No pressure. <laughs> well, Dr. Yu, if you want the panelists to participate, I can uh, perhaps offer a parallel with uh, Renaissance and medieval dramatists, where there is the same issue of lack of stage directions. If you look at Shakespeare, his contemporaries, we don't know how those people envisioned their pieces to be performed, and that lends itself to a number of adaptations. I mean, Shakespeare is probably the most adapted author to this day, so I see real parallels, and I'm not sure for the reason why there are no uh, performance instruction or no abundance of performance instruction in music, but in theater, what was going on is that most often those plays were not written for posterity. They were written to be performed there and now, and the playwright was actually present during the staging, and he could give uh, directions right there. So there was no reason to annotate the play, and also for today, what we would call the uh, copyright prison where, uh, you know, Shakespeare, for example, did not want his plays to be distributed and he did not want other theater companies to know how to stage them. So that's another reason. So uh, I'm wondering if there is a parallel with lack of uh, performance notations in music with what was happening on medieval and Renaissance stage. Well, I will say that a lot of medieval music um, was transmitted orally it's not written down until very a long it's in the case of plain chant centuries and centuries after it's being performed um so you're learning it from the person from the source right there so like there's no reason to say make this note longer and make this one louder you're just learning it from the person who's in front of you who's learned it from the person before them etc that's the case with um secular songs and sacred ones when you get into pieces that are a little bit more complicated in terms of um, rhythmic uh, specificity and things like that, then we have to start writing down how long notes are and where how the melody should move. But again, still, um, the idea of learning music from a score is a relatively recent um, development. And I think that's probably part of the reason, in, in my period anyway, why we don't see a lot of um, 
score annotations because you didn't need them for very similar reasons to what you've said, Dr. Pilkington. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I, and I think Professor Talley actually earlier mentioned about the, the trying the organ at in, 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 you know, when she was in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, so that, that actually brings us to another thing is period instruments. Uh, right. You know, right. how that helped us to understand you know, uh, even the composer don't have as much hints. And, and that's the thing, but when we play about like I'm string players and we're talking about like, oh yeah, you always tell people to play Mozart, play short or play Bach, play shorter. Because you, like, why, you know? But once I try the Baroque bows, then I was, oh wait, the weight actually just d diminished. I, I can not actually sustain as much. So naturally I do that. Um, and, and I think does that happen quite a bit to you, like Dr. Lee, like when you play on a harpsichord, like, you know, that's the articulation. That's exactly what I feel like that should be, like playing handle. You know, when you play on a Steinway, I don't get the same. Oh, no, they are not the same. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 even like all instruments are are different. I mean, as as a pianist, when I when I travel to play on different pianos, the the touch on each piano is actually very different. And as a performer, you, you one has to adjust every single time during your rehearsal time, um, and you have to decide what to do um, to 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 make to make the the music uh, beautiful. Now back to um, historic instruments. Um, um, when, when I go play on different, uh, different harpsichords, they, they, they're all different. I have to make decisions as to what, what registration, what stops to use. And it's also very similar to, 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 to playing on the organ. You, mm -hmm. you prepare a piece, but you would, you would do different registration interpretations and other things um, when, when you perform the same piece on different um, instruments or organs specifically. So, um, so um, in, in regards to um, his, the topic of historically informed performance, I think I wanted to point out that I think we're all trying to, to be uh, faithful interpreters of the music that we play. There are things that we, we can, we, we, we don't know for sure. So that's why scholars actually debate and argue about, about the different things. You know, for example, how to interpret an ornament, how to interpret a, a specific spot, et cetera. But, but I think it's very important to have the spirit of, of being faithful interpreters of, of the music that we play. And more importantly, this does not apply to just music before 1750. Yes. This applies to all music, all art music, I would say, that, that, that we play. When, when you are playing Brahms, Maninoff, John Cage, um, think, think about, uh, think about what, what you should do, what technique you should apply, um, things like that. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, um, we are actually have to move on to our last part of the uh, panel discussion. Actually, that's very related to what we are talking about, but practicality. Yes. Um, and I want to I want to add one more thing. It's like, yeah, if you play, you know, thinking about playing, you know, Elvis Presley's music with his Elvis Presley's guitar, you know, not just you know, we we always think about like early music that applies to a lot of things as well. Anyway. So practicality, what are some challenges in making that work? You know, um, like Dr. Lee, I, I, you know, I was so impressed by your recital. Like you have three different harpsichords and playing different music. I could totally feel the differences, like how the sound came out, you know, from the, you know, the French, you know, and the, the little Italian, um, it, it just speaks so much. Now, what, what about, you know, well, my home, like I have a little, little small apartment. I can't have three, up you know, half court or, or like, you know, I'm, I, if I'm a poor student, uh, I don't, I don't have, um, you know, a pipe organ in my home. So what, what can we do with, um, how can we make this work? That's the last part we want to 
how to talk. Well, we're, we are trying to make that work a little bit with the Baroque organ in Dunford Auditorium. And Dr. Yu and I are working very hard to get it more exposure on campus so that there is more interest in it because it is an incredibly authentic way to learn about the drawbacks and the advantages of playing on a so-called mechanical action instrument where every time you push a little key down, you're activating the valve that activates the wind in the pipe. And that's a totally different sensation than pressing the key down and all you're doing is you know, touching electric switch. And you don't get nearly the range of expressivity, of course, by touching electric switch as you do when you can press slowly down the key and feel the valve open on the pipe where you can do a lot with expression in that. The downside for the little Baroque organ is everything in terms of dynamics is terraced, everything. You don't have any real potential for diminuendo crescendo other than just doing an abrupt change in registration. We don't have the wonderful little expression pedal that came into vogue in organ playing and organ building in the late 19th century. And I'm not saying one is better or one is worse. I'm taking Dr. Lee's position of, you have to remember when was this music composed and what was the composer thinking about in terms of an instrument that he had to work with. And, and, and a composer that is not at all related to our discussion, but was so pivotal in the late 19th, early 20th century, Cesar Franck, he wrote for a very, very specific kind of pipe organ. And you, if you don't play his music with that knowledge, you're just, you're kind of missing out. But what I, I'm hoping we can show the organ students and early music advocates on campus is this little Baroque organ can teach you so much about what it was to express music in the Baroque era if you sit down and play it. Yeah, yeah. So, so that actually brought us some a lot of things to, that we can continue to talk about. Yeah, and there, there are drawbacks, you know, as you know, like, okay, gut strings, you know, great strings, and the, but then they, they break so easily, they get out of tune all the time. Why should we <laughs> use them? People are saying things that like that way. Um, so yeah, the question is, you know, how, you know, it's always pros and cons, like a doctor give you some medicine, it's like, well, there's always side effect, but what's, you know, but the, the, you have better results, it's balanced well, you know, than, than the side effect and stuff like that. So how much we can get the best out of it with it more economically. Uh, Dr. Lee, um, like how can students do, can achieve similar effect if they do it on more than piano? How then, how can the mindset of interpretation with choreo inform, is that possible going to the modern instruments? Or kind of a blend? I think, I think it's possible. I think, um, um, I, I, I'm totally open to, to interpreting um, um, Baroque Renaissance music. Uh, or if you're a pianist, if you're a keyboardist, I'm totally open to use the modern piano. Um, I, I think it's very important that when, when one plays on the piano, then you, you, one has to apply a certain amount of pia piano technique but at the same time, uh, it, 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 this doesn't stop you from, from studying the, 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 uh, the, the interpretation uh, or a better interpretation of ornamentation. It doesn't stop you from being able to improvise uh, or to realize the figured bass if you are playing in an ensemble setting. Um, now, um, if, if one wants to, to have a taste on, on period instruments, I, I would encourage students to, to, um, to, to talk to professors who have that experience and, um, and also to, to contact um, um, service organizations like, like the Recorder Society, the Gamba Society, uh, that would actually offer resources uh, for, for beginners to, to, to learn and to experience these instruments. Now, as far as I understand, I think um, DSU at some point received a grant that, that from, from Viola da Gamba Society. So now you have a set of, of instruments that are on loan, a set of uh, vial instruments, a set of vials that are on loan to the university. So this is a very good program to, to, to let uh, learners, beginners to, to, to sample uh, 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 or to pick up yeah, that's, um, that's, that's period instruments. 
yeah, because the time I do like to have Dr. Levitsky talk about, uh, well, yeah, definitely. And I put out the links that uh, Dr. Lee, you talk about the Gamma Society. It's on the chat, uh, a little bit about the Gamma Society and also Early Music America, a great organization. Dr. Levitsky, like, there are singers in here, like, well, what about, you know, how I, how can I transition, you know, those who are just so used to train in bel canto style singing and how can you switch back and forth? How is that practical? Is that possible? It's definitely practical. It's definitely possible. I mean, singers, when you start learning um, singing in classical music writ large, as we talked about earlier, you, you learn what's called bel canto style developed in the 19th century. We wouldn't use that in early music because it's anachronistic. It's developed after a lot of the music that we would be singing. And as we've been talking about, you have to think about the, um, the things that are going on at that particular time. Singing is, is an interesting one because there's a, a movement that happens in England in the 60s, 70s um, called sort of the revival of early music. And it has to do a lot with choral groups that have boy sopranos and they have a really particular tone. There's no vibrato. It's, it's very like light and sort of airy in some cases and it sounds really distinct. And if you've heard it, um, you would you would recognize it immediately. And um, what has happened is this sound has really caught the world by storm and, and every vocal group that does early music now wants its female singers to sing this way. We have a totally different vocal apparatus. Uh, we've hit puberty for one, there, there's that, but also like just the way that your voice is, is built is completely different. And I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect women to sing that way sort of across the board no matter what piece of early music you're doing because some pieces were not per performed in sacred settings where we think we would have had boy sopranos singing at very particular at specific moments in time not sort of as a blanket statement throughout the middle ages and the renaissance um there's a time when boys, when uh, women stop singing in the church and that carries on for a while, but it's certainly not the case in every century that we're talking about. And women are also performing other kinds of music. Um, we have manuscript illuminations showing women and men singing together. We have um, descriptions and narrative romances talking about men and women singing together. We have a bunch of information uh, that isn't just from knowing that certain types of people, men and boys were singing in the church at certain points and singing certain kinds of music. So um, I would definitely say that while you wouldn't wanna carry your bel canto style into singing some of these types of pieces of music, it's not something that you, um, having trained in that style, you couldn't bring into singing early music because singing bel canto teaches you a lot of things that are applicable more broadly. Good control, breath support, all of these things that you need to sing full stop. Um, you would just want to spend a little bit of time rethinking how some of the bel canto elements of what you're producing wouldn't apply to, to other um, types of repertoire, if that if that answers your question. Yeah, that's ab absolutely. Um, we, we are out of time now, and this is so awesome. That's such a great discussion. I think this is almost like a starting point, you know, today's discussion to, for all of you, a, a lot of you, especially. Um, I guess, you know, actually, you know, you could have, um, you know, with the, with the informed mind, you can play, play on modern instrument, you know, a modern piano, or, you know, sing uh, with that in mind. Uh, in, but on the other hand, you could also play old, in, you know, uh, play on old instruments. There may be composers writing new music for it. Um, I, I'm doing some of that in one of my projects. And I think and that's, that's the thing about uh, looking at old and new music. And, and we don't want, you know, as, as going back to the opening that actually uh, dovetail a little bit that there's not a clear definition. This is early music. This is the way of playing. And, and some people categorize that way, uh, but you know, if we look carefully, that's that's open up to new doors and rethink about what we can do. Well, thank you so much for the for the panelists for you know such a great you know discussion and thank you all of you for participating. Um, any last minute questions from any one of you? Um, well, thank you so much, and here ends our DSU Early Music Festival 2021, and and I'm, we're looking forward to. Um, you know, next time and oh my god, I saw Peter has a little quick I'm SLP.
Um, but Sign of the Peak Comfort much early music repertoire. Yes. Yes, it does. So does um, CPDL, Choral Public Domain Library. That obviously has a lot of vocal music, but IMSLP has both vocal and other. Yeah. Absolutely. Free. Why, why not? It's without copyright. Be sure. <laughs> <laughs> And good music there. And you actually can find Fasimile, which is the manuscript, you know, um, I mean, photocopy or, you know, of that. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you. Thanks for organizing it. See you all. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um,